But you grab Wally and put yeah. him into a Petri dish. With all the other ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're listening to The Cosmic Cast. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Cosmic Cast. You're here with me, national egg and spoon race champion for the last 20 years, Rick Viver here. To my right, standing in for Tom, we have uh, the coolest kumquat that I know, Marissa Lowe, <laughs> and uh, the usual uh, John. He's Howdy. Here. <laughs> and can I just say to this next guest, happy birthday <laughs> to you, happy <laughs> birthday <laughs> to you, happy, <laughs> okay, stop there, because we don't want to get copyright infringement. <laughs> uh, uh, welcome to Emma Waters. Hello. Hello. So Emma, you are a igneous petrologist at the University of Manchester. Yes, I am. And I should say thank you for coming on today. No, it's okay. Uh, how are you doing? Uh, I'm pretty good, yeah. And it is your birthday. It is my birthday so and the sun is out. So, yeah. yeah. And the one thing you wanted to do on your birthday was come onto this train wreck of a podcast. Yeah. Which, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. So normally what we like to start off with is uh, asking our guests how they actually got into the field that they work in. So you're not from England, you're from Scotland. Yeah. Where, where did you study in Scotland and what brought you to Manchester? Okay, well, I did an undergraduate bachelor's degree in earth science at the University of Glasgow. And it's a, a little bit different to a bachelor's in England, um, mainly because it's four years. Mm. Um, but other than that, the, the subject's the same. We just do an extra year to make up for the, the differences between the Scottish higher and uh, an A-level. Okay. Um, so I, I did that for four years and the way the degree structure went, you picked three subjects in your first year, went down to two in your second and then for your final two you pick what you do for your honours. So for me that was earth science um, and I studied ge- uh, geography with the uh, first year and chemistry throughout first and second year. So by the end of the degree I had quite a good background in sort of major geology and chemistry. So. Oh, what attracted you to actually want to do ge- uh, geology and geography? Well I sort of fell into it by accident to be honest. Um, I actually at the end of high school had in my head I was going to go to medical school. Okay. Um, so I applied for medical school at the end and when you apply you get your five choices as normal and I picked four medical schools and they, they recommend your final choice is something that's not medicine to give okay. you a bit of background. Um, or a backup, should I say. Uh, so I sort of started to think about it and I decided if I didn't do medicine, I didn't want to do a um, medical type subject. Okay, I wanted yeah, yeah. to do something completely different. So I started having a look around and I always liked outdoor things and I liked geography in school. So I went along to open days and started to find out about geology mm. uh, and because I liked physical geography, decided that was more for me. So put it down in the application form and I didn't get into the medical schools okay. and after having a think about it and um, talking to people at the universities I kind of came to the conclusion that I really fancied the geology. Yeah so, so it was a blessing. Like you yeah, yeah I mean I think it totally worked out for me and that was meant to happen you know mm. I'm quite glad that I did and if, if I went back and met 17 year old me applying to university mm-hmm. I'd tell her you know just go for the geology mm-hmm. don't even bother trying with medical school. Um, you like it much more. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm quite glad. I don't think I could have been a, a medical doctor now that I've kind of come out the end of it. So I have something quite similar. So I applied for mostly mechanical engineering. All right. And then um, geology with planetary science is the only thing I got because I went for something completely different as yeah. well. And I'm really glad that that's how yeah. it worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Do yeah. they use UCAS uh, at Scottish universities? They do. So it, it works exactly the same way yeah. um, for us. The only difference, I suppose, is unconditional offers are a lot more common oh okay um so we go to high school for six years yeah uh between the ages of about 11 to 12 to 17 18 Mm -hmm. um so you set when you set your gcse's when i was there we'd set standard grades which is now changed to national fives okay and then after that you get a choice so you can continue on in high school or you can leave at the end of that and go into college apprenticeships or work uh, so I chose to stay on and that's when we do hires so in our final two years of high school the actual course only lasts a year 
So at the end of your fifth year, you can have all the qualifications that you really need to get into university. Mm. And then the final year is about whether you want to do more hires or you can do an advanced hire, uh, which is more similar to an A-level. Okay. Uh, so it's quite good. I mean, if you get to the end of your fifth year and decide you want to do something completely different, you can redo all your mm. hires. Mm. So most people tend to take the sixth year um, to do things of interest if they've got the need or to do the A-levels to prepare you a bit better for university. So we get potentially an unconditional offer because you have all the grades you need. So yeah, yeah. I got the unconditional for coming in to do our sciences. So, it, mm. you know, whilst applying to medical school, the nice knowledge in the background that if it didn't work out, there was something else as an mm. option. I like how you came onto the podcast just to show off that you got an unconditional offer. That's fine. <laughs> that's, fine. that's what we're here for. Uh, uh, what did you study at the university that made you think, oh, I want to go on to do a PhD then? I would really enjoyed continuing on with chemistry at the same time, but really the earth science was the thing that drew me in. So the fourth year of my degree, we do a research project, which makes up quite a major part of it. And I think actually we were really lucky with that. It's not as common a feature of a lot of degrees. Mm. So I really appreciate you know, that Glasgow gave us that option. And when you come in and for the fourth year, the way they did it, you got a sort of booklet with a lot of projects described in it that you could read through and then a session with all the supervisors who proposed those projects to kind of a chat. So I knew early on I wanted a project that kind of would combine the geology and the chemistry. Mm. So I looked at all the projects and really got interested in one which was put forward by an igneous geochemist at Glasgow called Ian Neil, mm -hmm. um, and got talking to him about the project, decided that was the one I wanted to do, put my name down for it and, and get picked. So throughout the whole of my fourth year, really most of my time was dedicated to that with some courses alongside. So I got to see different techniques, got to use the SEM, I got to go out to CERC, which is the Scottish University's Environmental Research mm. Centre, where they have a lot of geochemical equipment, got to see that, do um, ICPMS out there, and really started to enjoy it. So maybe by the the end of December that year, I decided I wanted to keep going, having had that little taste. Mm. So uh, I had some really supportive people at Glasgow who helped me with the application when I said that's what I wanted to do and put it out there kind of not really expecting to get anything uh, just coming from bachelors but mm. put it out see what happened and managed to get some offers out of it oh. so yeah so where else did you apply so I applied to Edinburgh uh, Glasgow Leeds and Cardiff as well as Manchester uh, all through NERC DTPs mm. and ended up getting an offer from Edinburgh and Manchester in the end. Okay. So decided this was the place to me. I was going to be a southerner. Okay. Well, well, the, oh, yeah. So, you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, what attracted you about the project here then? So my project's based in Iceland, which was a really big draw. I mm. really liked the idea of going out and getting to work in Iceland. Um, there's options to go and work, you know, in Italy and some people in my group, but... I don't do well in, in the heat, mm. so Iceland was a much better yeah. fit for me, Essentially the same climate as Scotland. Yeah, a bit colder, a <laughs> bit colder. Um, in Scotland, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, but I, no, it, it was a place that I'd been to once before when I was 13 and maybe not quite appreciated it as much. Mm. And now that I had the interest in geology, really wanted to go back. Uh, it also gave me a lot of opportunities to look at different geochemical analytical techniques. Mm. So to expand really on what I'd learned uh, very briefly in my fourth year project try and get a bit more of a background in that and um, mm. give me a bigger range to do more work in the future so i guess the the obvious question now is then what is your project on okay so the title of it is a uh, halogen heterogeneity in the icelandic mantle source which as a synopsis is looking at different volcanic zones in iceland and trying to figure out what the halogen content is of different mantle supports that supply those systems. So I do that through melt inclusions, which are tiny droplets of melt that as a crystal grows in a magma, get trapped as it grows, and they can then be preserved within that crystal when they're erupted to the surface. So 
volatile species like ha the halogens in water, carbon, which when a magma erupts will degas, you can preserve those concentrations in those trapped inclusions. So it's a good way to get a bit of a, a window. What, what sort of size are these melt inclusions? So they're really small. Um, some of the smallest that I work with are maybe about 20 microns, and that can go up to a couple of hundred microns in really big ones. Um, so you, the analytical techniques that we use have to be really small focused beams so that you can get in there. I guess this ties in quite well then with uh, what uh, Zoltan was talking about uh, a few weeks ago then. Yeah. So you're both looking at uh, hotspot areas basically. So what's uh, so special about the halogens then? What's the, why, why is it so important to track uh, the halogens ask, through the... I'm a lonely guy who looks at images from a yeah. satellite. <laughs> <laughs> what is a halogen? How, so halogens are a group of elements that you would see in the periodic table just before the noble gases. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. Um, they're volatile species, so they exist as volcanic gases. So you don't tend to get them preserved in lava flows or anything like that. And they're quite important to know about uh, for a range of reasons. Some of them are volcanic risk. Obviously, these are not so great gases to have in an atmosphere. Mm. Um, but other things, they, they tend to be concentrated in surface reservoirs. So by that I mean the surface crust and seawater. Particularly though, if you've got sediments that have a lot of organic material, mm. iodine's found quite commonly in life. So if you get matter that's uh, preserved in that organic sediment, you've got high concentrations of iodine. That seawater, which has high concentrations of halogens, that can infiltrate crust and cause chemical changes, which increase the halogen content of that crust. Which then means when you subduct all that crust that's got organic sediment and water infiltrating it, you have a lot of halogens going in mm. to the mantle, which are a much higher concentration to normal mantle. So really, one of the things my project's looking at is can we use those halogens to trace that crust that's being subducted into the mantle? Um, I've spent a lot of work recently, which yes, you can. What we don't really know is how far down it can go. Mm -hmm. um, Halogens, when you take them down, are in minerals and materials that like to break down mm -hmm. as you subduct them. So they get released very easily in the shallow mantle. The missing piece then is, can they get deep, mm -hmm. really? Can we mm -hmm. get them down to the deep mantle where hotspots, for example, might bring them back up to yeah. the surface or not? Like these uh, mantle plumes. That yeah. Will, yeah. yeah, exactly. Form places like Iceland. And, yeah. yeah, so uh, yeah, we were talking to Zoltan about that because he's been working on similar things. Yeah. And, uh, so I guess from his his research, he seems to think that, yes, they can somehow go deep enough to get into the mantle plumes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I assume, has, has your research found a similar... I think probably too early to see if my research is going to add to that. Mm. But I'd say from the field, it's very much looking that way. Um, it's just a case of how does it get there in the mm -hmm. first place. Mm -hmm. the, the nice thing I have working in Iceland compared to maybe other mantle plumes is that you have a mantle plume overlying a mid-ocean ridge. So all of a sudden you've got that extra complexity of mm. a deep mantle plume source in addition to a shallow mid-ocean ridge. So you get to play with deep sources and shallow sources at the same time and potentially mixing between them. The The fact that the mid-ocean ridge comes straight across Iceland going all the way through means you can sample pretty much an entire section of mantle mm. as well by going across the country. So I assume you actually had to do that then, you had to I did, go out yes. there. Uh, I've been out to Iceland twice. Okay, um, yeah, it's showing off again on the podcast, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so when did you go out to Iceland and, and what would your day-to-day -day be while you were out there? So I, the first time I went out was just before I started my PhD. Uh, my supervisor, Margaret Hartley, she sent me an email and said that her and Katie Street, the postdoc who works on similar things, uh, was where they were going out for part of the summer. And asked if I'd like to tag along on the trip uh, since it was to collect my samples. So I, I said yes. Yeah. Um, Would have so, been rude if you said no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> bad first yeah. impression. Yeah. Um, and then Katie and I went back again last summer. When you arrive, you've got, you have to take a tent, all your camping equipment, um, because I said we're going right across Iceland to try and get a range of things. We're maybe only in one area 
a day or so yeah. at a time. And we hired a Toyota Hilux, which <laughs> is a beast of a car. Yeah. Uh, Not a sponsor, by the way. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think I've ever seen a truck quite so big. Okay. Um, threw everything in the back and set off. So if you've ever been testing, there's, there's a main road, Highway 1, which goes right around the country. Okay. And then there's also the interior road, which is only open during the summer. Oh and God. you can only go on it with a 4 by 4 Okay. Uh, which was an experience that I'd never seen off-road driving until uh, we got to um, a large body of water, which you think you can't get across. But no, okay. you're that, that's that's the way Iceland way. You, uh-huh. you drive through the river. <laughs> I mean, you said you wanted to do geology because you like the outdoors. Yeah. So it's lucky that you're an outdoorsy person. Yeah, yeah. There's always that um, slight fear that when you go in that you might not quite get out the other side <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a bit of a male panic um but we, we'd never get stuck thankfully um if it, margaret and katie have both been out many times before me so they know what they were doing yeah. <laughs> so yeah we we go out get as far as we could to a potential sample site pitch up the tent and then look, some people were lucky it was a case of drive along the road mm. jump out the car collect the sample uh, other times it was leave the car as far as we could get it and uh, walk the rest yeah, of the yeah. way, um, collect some sample. Bring so it most of it would be travelling a lot yeah, of Yeah, there's a lot of driving, right a sites, lot of driving yeah. just to get to the yeah. areas. Um, and that's either areas that other people have been to so we know there's going to be a sample yeah. or a couple of times we've had a bit of a, from reading or looking at maps, idea that, well, there could be something here. Why don't we go and take a look? Yeah, yeah. Um, which I did last year uh, when we went out. I suggested an area to go and see if we could find anything, mm. uh, which we didn't think was going to be very good, but managed to get a sample. So I, I the peak of my PhD was getting that right. But <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> just two more years ago. Yeah. How, how how do you choose your samples then? Because if you told me to go to Iceland and bring back some rocks, I'd just be wandering around picking up the pretty looking ones. How yeah. do you choose well, your you ones? You would have gone to that shop first, of all. <laughs> <laughs> the frozen goods shop, rather than. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so some of it is quite easy. Um, if people have been to areas before um, and have found melt inclusions from those areas, uh, there's been a lot of work in Icelandic melt inclusions before we're just taking a slightly different angle on it. So some of them have been, well, author X found melt mm. inclusions here so we'll go and look there okay so are they quite rare these melt inclusions to find in rocks no they're quite common um but it's just easier if you know you're going to go somewhere where you can get them rather than go and collect the sample and then process it all to find none of your crystals have inclusions okay um and we have a couple of um collaborators at the university of iceland as well Mm -hmm. that we've worked with over the years so sometimes they have just in their notebook, actual grid point references of mm. I went here and, and found something. Uh, the other ones that I found were more having a look at just a geological map and knowing the units we had to go. So we sample subglacial um, lava flows, mm. basically because it means when you erupt, your lava comes straight up under an ice cap, mm-hmm. which means any melt inclusions that you've got in there are quenched rapidly so they become a glass. Mm. If you don't have that and they can cool down slowly, you can start to crystallize minerals inside those inclusions, which then means there's an extra step in having to analyze them of making them a glass. So heating them up and hand quenching them yourself to Mm. make everything a melt again. So it saves a lot of time. So just by looking at the map and finding those units, it gives you an idea of, well, there could be something in here, but it's possibly someone's just not gone and had a look. So why don't we spend a day where we drive out, have a look around, see what we can find, and then if we get something great, and if we don't, well, carry on. So how much was your camping locations dictated by the location of hydrothermal springs? <laughs> um, it's a question not... he asks everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my main memory of going to Iceland in the past is just uh, sitting in hot rivers and being very pleasant in the evenings. <laughs> uh, well, the first time we went out, we ended up in the north of Iceland for a bit. So we, there was one campsite we stayed at which is near the, the Grey Lagoon, 
if you've ever been, mm-hmm. which is the Grey Lagoon. The Grey Lagoon, not the Blue Lagoon. Not the Blue Lagoon. I didn't no. know it came another yeah, place. Yeah, I, I didn't know until um, <laughs> I'd went up, uh, and it was great. It was just near the campsite, and my supervisor knew it was there, mm. so we went along. It's mostly locals. Uh, very similar idea to the to the Blue Lagoon, um, but not quite as busy. I just because it's right up the the top of the country that not many tourists tend to go to. But it's great. You you go in, you pay, you can place an order at the bar as you arrive <laughs> and uh, your drink's brought out to you as oh. you're sitting in the but then last year uh, you have to camp in approved campsites there's no wild camping allowed mm. in yeah. Iceland to protect any vegetation that can grow so we'd stay just in campsites that were convenient to the sample areas we're going to or meant we didn't have to drive for hours uh, what I hadn't realized on that side of the country that we went to all of the shivers were coin operated if you want hot water <laughs> and I took a credit card right. <laughs> oh. so uh, there was um, a great shower had in the youth hostel back in Reykjavik when we got back oh. I, I stayed there for a good hour that's why they call you smelly Emma yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how long did you spend out in Iceland so your trip? the first time I was out for 12 days okay oh, so uh, it's it fairly quick turnaround, yeah yeah, really, yeah you don't tend to stay out for, yeah. for too long and you're working every day so you yeah. don't really get a day off but then yeah. a lot of that's spent driving and traveling mm. uh, the second time i was out for 10 days as well so how many samples do you get within that time um so typically one a day okay. unless there's a couple that are quite close together mm. um then we can maybe get two or three in if we're picking off places but mm. uh, the sample collection itself doesn't take very long yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's more getting there. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's the getting there that yeah. takes the time so there would be some days you'd get in the car and drive for quite a few hours to mm get the sample and then that's you done for the day because you're not going to make it yeah, know, yeah. to the next place. So you have these 10 to 12 samples each time you go. Mm. And what do you do with them once you get back into Manchester? So I come back with effectively small chunks of glass. So um, if you know what a pillow lava is, it would be the glass rim that forms in that pillow lava. Okay. Um, I don't you, know what yeah. a pillow okay. lava is. Thought, okay. So pillow lavas get typically erupted underwater. Um, and the shape that they form is because they're erupted underwater. Uh, you get the same thing on Iceland because it's erupting under ice. Okay, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, say. it cools quickly, yeah. um, which forms the pillow shape. And because it cools quickly, you get a rim of glass where that milk's just cooled mm-hmm. so rapidly it can't start to even crystallize. So inside those glass rims, uh, there are crystals, typically olivines and plagioclase crystals. So I crush up the big chunk of glass get the crystals out and then sit with a binocular microscope so just a a big hand lens effectively and look to see if there's any inclusions inside those Mm. uh, crystals separate them all out and then i have a so how do you separate them out yeah with a set of tweezers oh wow yeah um mineral picking is a very very long long job yeah and it takes a long so time. So like, where's Wally? But you actually grab him <laughs> a, once a little bit. Him. I felt like that, but you grab Wally and put <laughs> yeah. him into a petri dish with all the other ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, I got a lot of podcasts actually from mineral picking. Okay, uh, yeah, so yeah. it was a good time to catch up. But yeah, sit and do that for quite a long time. Mm. Then try and find the ones that you think are biggest, and then you get the very fun job once you've spent hours picking it, of uh, gluing those crystals onto a slide. Okay. And hand polishing each crystal so that the inclusion is exposed at the surface. Uh, Once that's all done, you can mount it up in some resin, and then you have a nice series of crystals with melt inclusions all exposed, (laughs) which hopefully you then don't polish away when you're you're polishing up that little mount. I love it. It sounds like a big arts and crafts project. (laughs) It is. is. One of those things, when I started, it took forever, but now I'm at the point I've been doing it so long that I can process samples really quickly. Yeah, Yeah, it's quite nice. Sometimes it's therapeutic and sometimes... uh, I, I really stop enjoying it after an hour. It depends on the day. But so what's the end goal of getting all this stuff mounted? Then so once it's mounted, yeah, yeah, we can put it onto microbeam techniques. So here in Manchester, we have an electron microprobe, yeah. which basically has a very focused electron beam, which when it hits a sample, electrons are ejected at a certain wavelength, which is a characteristic of an element. Uh, and then we pick them up on detectors and that can tell us the concentration of different elements in that mm. sample effectively um so do that to get some of the elements 
I work up in Edinburgh and the NERC Iron Probe facility, they have a secondary iron mass spectrometer, mm. which works in a kind of similar way. It's, a, it's an iron beam which hits the sample uh, and then does some mass spectrometry, so makes a plasma out of that mm. sample, fires it through a mass spectrometer, and each of the elements is separated according to its mass charge, put them in little buckets effectively, and it, it counts to tell you the concentration of mm. those elements. So we do that for things that are particularly low concentration. It's got a much higher detection limit, so the halogens, volatile species, rare earth elements, things like that all get done up in Edinburgh. If you see that your sample has a, a large quantity of a certain type of halogen, mm -hmm. what does that tell you about the, the sample then? So it it may not tell us anything specifically about that sample. Um, what we start to look at is different trends between different areas. A high concentration doesn't necessarily mean that it is uh, from maybe a recycle source seep down. Those could come from a slightly different area. Mm -hmm. What we're interested in is ratios with things. Okay. So when you crystallize magma, that can change the, the chemistry of it. And it's all to do whether elements are compatible or incompatible within elements. So if you are an olivine and am, yes. you're crystallizing in a magma chamber, the elements that you really like are magnesium and iron. Okay. So you're yes, going to start yes. taking magnesium and iron out of that melt. So the melt effectively gets lower in concentration than magnesium and iron. Uh, whereas everything that you don't take is going to be left behind. So mm. halogens are not very compatible. They don't really like to fit in lattice. So the concentration can increase just by crystallizing, okay, right. which wouldn't tell us anything about mm -hmm. the source. Mm -hmm. yeah. What will tell us about the source is an element which behaves in a similar way. So if you dislike an element as much as you dislike the halogens, no matter what you crystallize, the ratio between them won't change. Mm -hmm. That will stay the same. So once we get the halogens, we have to start comparing them to other elements which behave the same way in our magma system and see whether the ratios are different between different areas, which would tell us whether there's sources with very different halogen concentrations in them, whether that's across Iceland or within one magma system, mm. is there different uh, magma sources or mantle sources supplying those? Um, and then if you get a very big spike in halogens, that would be quite interesting because we could start to look at, well, is there then potentially recycled crust involved in that mantle source? And if there is, how deep did it get trapped? Was it relatively shallow crust? Was it really towards the core mantle boundary, which would mean potentially you could get material subducting to that to depth. That level. Yeah, yeah, and still preserving the yeah. halogens with it. Yeah, yeah. so this yeah. is all part of the, the question that we're mm. trying to work on. So have you done these techniques on any other samples or just your ones from Iceland? Uh, just my ones in, in Iceland, Okay, yes. but are these techniques... We know that uh, from speaking to Zoltan that he's done it on basinites from El Hierro and the Canary yeah. Islands. Is it yeah, it's a very, done on a lot so, of different yeah, areas? Yeah, they're very standard techniques in geochemistry and other forms of chemistry. Uh, they are quantitative, which is what makes them really useful. Um, and you can get very small spot sizes. So some of the work that I've done before in Glasgow, for example, is the whole rock geochemistry. So for those, you just take a large bit of the rock, crush it up into a powder and use that powder. So mm -hmm. that'll give you an overall picture. But if you want to know about the chemistry of specific minerals, it won't give you that. That's where you need to go into these really small scale techniques. So you can take a very thin slice of the rock, you can do what I do and mount up different kind of crystals and measure that. Uh, it also gets used a lot in material science, particularly the, the APMA, the electron microprobe. They'll use it to look at metals that mm -hmm. have been grown to see if there's any particular structures. So I've, I've sat in on um, one person's session and they were looking at a, a piece of metal that they'd grown and had uh, what they thought was the main metal, but every so often bands of another metal where elements had concentrated. So things like that that you wouldn't see unless mm. you'd, you'd mapped it this way. <laughs> so have you got plans to present this work anywhere? 
Hopefully. Um, I've just submitted an abstract for Goldschmidt Barcelona mm -hmm. this year. Um, so I'm waiting to hear whether I have been assigned a talk or a poster for that. So hopefully I'll know for certain soon. Will that be your I'll first be major conference? It will be, yeah, my first international one. I've been to VMSG twice, which is the Volcanic and Magnetic Studies Group. So that's just a small yeah, local... Yeah, it's a small local national conference. So uh, volcanologists, magmatic studies people from across the UK kind of gathering. Though there have been, particularly this year, I noticed a few people travelling further afield to come along to that, which was... Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had someone from... Uh, Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA yeah. giving a talk. To so. VMSG? Yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, it was Rosalie Lopez. Wow. wow. Yeah, they had a planetary volcanism session there this year. Wow, oh, that's yeah. awesome. So, yeah, I mean, Goldschmidt is um, it's probably one of the largest huge, geochemical yeah. conferences, I guess, in the world, attracting certainly in the thousands. I feel like I've asked you this before, Elliot, how many people go to Goldschmidt? I think there were, I think there were about 3,000. 3,000 people. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, several yeah. thousand people. Mm. So, um, so larger than LPSC. Much larger than LPSC. LPSC yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I find it quite an overwhelming experience, actually. Uh, conferences that large. Which is where you said you found it. Well, it's very broad. Yeah, you end up, you know, not really going to a huge amount of relevant sessions, and it's. Yeah. This is where John says he was sleeping the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what he said to me? He didn't come to my talk at LPSC because he was asleep. Oh, John. <laughs> of course, that was just for comedic effect. Yeah, that's what he said. You didn't want me in the back of the room. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, you, so you, did you put in for a talk? I did put in for a talk. Do you want to talk at such a large conference? I'm going to go with optimistically, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Fair enough, yeah. yeah. Uh, I tend to, actually, I tend to prefer giving talks to a poster. Um, I'm the same, yeah. Yeah, I like having a bit more of a structure in my head of, of what I'm going to say. Mm. Uh, and even if I try and do that posters, I tend to find whenever someone comes up, I get a bit flustered trying to remember and find it quite hard to, to talk to someone in a very loud room like that. Mm, so I actually I'm prefer sorry, to yeah. give it a talk. That's where a few beers helps at poster yeah. sessions, I guess. Well, I'd find it difficult at a poster session because I'm quite deaf. That's why it's talk. Genuinely. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when I'm at a poster session, I find it really hard to hear what people are saying. And I often do the three head nod rule. Of just like going yes and nodding my head three times, <laughs> and then if they're still saying something, I I don't know whether they've asked me a different question or not. Do you just keep nodding? So, <laughs> keep nodding. Yeah. Oh <laughs> that must be a sight to behold. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much, Emma, for coming to talk to us about your research. That oh, was some very interesting stuff. Um, one last question that we uh, try and ask people okay. uh, on a regular basis is uh, just random people in the street. <laughs> just random people on the street. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. see someone shouting this question at <laughs> yeah. you yeah. as you're getting on the bus. It's probably John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just uh, yeah. If you're on Market Street in Manchester, just if you see someone shouting, it's probably me. No. Um, so Emma, is there a particular thing outside of Icelandic geochemistry that you find particularly interesting? My main one probably is actually education. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in teaching theory, mm. um, which I hadn't really thought about until I, I started. So I started on the side um, becoming a teacher for Scottish country dancing, okay. which mm. was my sort of first formal training in, in how you teach people, which was a really interesting experience to sit and think about how different people learn. Mm. And if you're going to teach a class of People, whether that's even demonstrating to you know undergraduate students that I do, I, I, you know the things that I apply from that, just recognizing whether someone learns through being visually shown something, being told something, or actually physically doing something, and having to adapt mm -hmm. your your way of, of teaching to do that. So I think if I wasn't doing what I do, I'd be really interested in getting into teaching and teaching training. Um, Particularly for higher education, I think, you know, it's there's a lot of opportunity for PhD students uh, to get really good teacher training and, mm. and how you teach somebody as opposed to you know what you're talking about on your go. Um, so that'd be something I'd be really interested in getting well, you're, more involved in. You're definitely ahead of the curve on that one. I mean, I suppose, you know, historically at universities, lecturers didn't really have any formal teaching qualifications. You were just thrown in there. But it's becoming more and more of an important thing that um, some, at least some training is imparted. And we've got things like the teaching excellence framework where some of the teaching is a bit more 
quantified and stuff. So I think universities are definitely moving in that direction. That's a really interesting uh, really interesting point. You're definitely ahead of the curve there. Uh, you were teaching pensioners geochemistry or petrology, weren't you, a few weeks yes, ago? Yes, I was. How did you get involved with teaching uh, pensioners petrology? So it started off... Um, <laughs> Actually, with teaching teenagers oh, really? metrology. Okay. Um, they they just aged very quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. All their cigarettes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I was contacted by someone in the school who does a lot of work with high schools trying to get students um, involved in geology because a lot of, particularly in Scotland when I was there, there was a lot of students who would go to university having no idea what geology is because yeah. it's, it's not offered as a subject. Yeah. Whereas, although it's in low numbers, there are some A-levels um, that I don't know about the rest of the UK, but from what I've seen being in Manchester, there's at least some in England that are, are still teaching it. So it was a, a bit of an idea to get some A-level students in who were doing geology to try and show them what it would be like if they continued that at university. Uh, university. Yeah. So we got them in and they'd, they'd been learning about rocks and minerals, but a lot of schools that teach A-level don't have the facility to do petrology as mm. you need a petrological microscope. So we had a teacher ask whether we could run a workshop for them. So I got involved with that. Then we had a University of the Third Age group who got in touch. And it was great. I, I really loved it. You get It's a very different sort of atmosphere teaching you know, A-level kids who are very used to school teaching and the formula of how that works versus retired age people who are purely there because they want to learn. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's no stress of an exam. And it was a really nice room to teach because mm -hmm. all they were asking were questions about things they were interested in. So we we got them in a room and they were given a, a sec series of thin sections and a series of hand specimens with a bit of an introduction of how petrology works and optical properties of different minerals and trying to see what by the end of two hours having looked at the hand specimen thin section, could they match them up and figure out what the rock was mm. and how it might have formed. So quite basic beginner's petrology for people who've maybe got a bit of experience with, with what a rock is. Mm. Um, but it was really enjoyable. And by the end of it, we had to leave about 20 minutes for, for questions just so they could... Uh. Yeah, we've done a lot of outreach since I've been here. A lot with maybe children in school age groups. So it was really nice to you know, get a different demographic mm, in and see yeah. how that worked. And they left an excellent array of biscuits in the tea oh, room as did. well. <laughs> so many biscuits. <laughs> so I guess on that note, <laughs> thank you for the array of biscuits and thank you for coming on to the podcast. No, thank you for having me. And I'm sure we'll have you again in the future. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Emma. Thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye.